Good morning. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, start by sharing guidance. Uh, this material is from A New Day. This is the Oxford Group uh, Meditation Guide. And our first uh, item is from Psalms 32.8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Many, many references within the Bible uh, to guidance. And then from Andrew Murray. When man in his littleness and God in his glory meet, we all understand that what God says has infinitely more worth than what man says. And yet our prayer so often consists in the utterance of our thoughts of what we need that we give God no time to speak to us. So that's why we're practicing prayer and meditation and writing God's guidance. We're going to give God time to speak this weekend. And every man has the privilege of being guided by God, Alan Tornhill. And I'm so grateful that so many of you have already done prayer and meditation this morning. But before we get into the session, I want to share with you a piece of uh, archival material that just surfaced uh, less than a month ago. And that is a digest, a survey of the Southeastern AA groups uh, written in September of 1947. This has been included in all of the teacher's guides. I mean, it's brand new and what the teacher's guides will continue to be updated. Everybody that has one with new material as it comes out. Uh, this was a survey of all the groups in the Southeast from Washington, D.C. Uh, throughout the entire Southland to uh, Louisiana. And of these groups, they summarized the responses that came in. And under education, it says, and I love the first word, only. They considered this to be a disappointment. Only about one half of the groups have an educational program for new members. Only one half had a beginner's meeting. But that means 50% of all groups in the South in 1947 had a beginner's meeting. That's how they got 75% recovery. Uh, educational program for new members. Uh, many have beginners or educational meetings. Materials employed are mainly the AA book and the 12 steps, which is precisely how we do Back to Basics. So I want to let you know that that's available. Uh, anybody that has uh, doubts in terms of the written fourth step, uh, in the 40s, this is the only evidence whatsoever that we have of a written fourth step. Uh, it came from a pamphlet out of Corpus Christi, Texas, the 12 Steps to Happiness, and they have the complete fourth step right there, a blank sheet of paper with assets on one side and liabilities on the other. That's the only written evidence of a fourth step that we have from the 1940s. I do want to share for a minute uh, why Back to Basics, one of the many reasons that Back to Basics has changed my life. And uh, as I said uh, earlier, uh, none of this existed a year ago. This groundswell from uh, just a dream to 300 groups in, in 12 months is just beyond anybody's <laughs> expectation. This is the first time that uh, Ellie and I uh, brought back to basics to Phoenix uh, on May 14, 1997. And I want to share with you what happened because when we walked in the room, we expected 20 to 30 people. There were over 110 people there waiting to take back to basics. In the court, this is a primary detox in Phoenix. And what happened is uh, there was a group of the people that were going through detox in the corner, a table of eight of them. And I went up to them and I, I tried to introduce myself to them, uh, but they were not uh, too receptive. Uh, and uh, one of them looked up at me and he said, well, you know we don't want to be here. And I said, well, we're going to do this just like it was the 1940s. And in the 1940s, many people were court ordered to Alcoholics Anonymous. Court ordered is not a new phenomenon. In fact, it was being done in Cleveland starting in 1941, and it was done in Akron starting in 1940. Uh, Cleveland in 1940, and Akron in 1941. I mean, that's how far back it goes. 
So just because these, I said, just because you don't want to be here doesn't mean it's not going to work. It worked in the 40s. There's no reason it's not going to work in the 90s. And they said, well, you know we're not going to read that book. And I said, well, we're going to do this just like the 40s. In the 40s, you didn't have to read the book. We will read the book to you. And what I found later is in the 40s, people didn't read the book because a lot of them couldn't afford the book. This is equivalent of a $60 book back in the 40s. So if a group passed the group, sometimes a group would have to pass the basket for months at a time to get the money for a book. So they had one book, and they taught the beginners meetings out of the book that they had. So they read the book to the newcomers. And they go, rrr, rrr, okay, I'm going to read the book. Rrr, rrr, okay. <laughs> well, you know we're not going to do that four step. And I don't realize these people have been here before. <laughs> and some of them, what I found out later, many times before. And I said, we're going to do this just like in the 1940s, and you don't have to write the four step. He said, what? What are you talking about? I said, we're going to write the four step for you. The sponsors are going to write the four step. And these guys were just absolutely dumbfounded. But when we asked for the newcomers to stand, all eight of them stood. And five of them completed the work and came back with newcomers the next month. Five out of eight of the, of the hardest of the hardcore, down-and-outers, primary detox, publicly funded, Phoenix, Arizona. If they can get it, anybody can get it. That's just about 75%. <laughs> Amazing how that works. But that was our experience from Phoenix. And it, and it, told, it showed me from firsthand experience that this will work for anybody, especially somebody that's been in and out of AA in the 90s for many, many years. So let's begin. There was a period in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous when the program produced an estimated 75% recovery rate from alcoholism. So how can we get reconnected with this glorious piece of our past? We need to take a trip back in time. As the announcer for the 1940s Lone Ranger radio program used to say, let us return now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. Okay, let's go. It is the fall of 1946. And for the rest of this session, it will be the fall of 1946. We truly are going to go back in time and conduct the meeting just as if it was the fall of 1946. You have a drinking problem and you telephone Alcoholics Anonymous for help. AA responds by sending two people out to see you. These ex-problem drinkers talk about their personal experiences with alcohol and how they found a way out. They tell you that as part of their recovery, they try to be of service to others. After listening to their stories, you agree to be hospitalized. They take you to a local sanitarium where you are withdrawn from alcohol. The process takes three days. During this period of time, you are visited by many of the members of the local AA group. Upon your release, you are assigned a sponsor, whose responsibility it is to accompany you to the Alcoholics Anonymous Beginners Meetings. You take all 12 steps in one month. Your life changes. You never drink again. Sounds incredibly simple, doesn't it? Well, it was simple and it worked. AA's remarkable recovery rate during the 1940s was due in large part to these four one-hour sessions. For many thousands of alcoholics, the beginner's meetings provided the foundation for a spiritual way of life which was essential for long-term contented sobriety. So let's imagine it is 8 o'clock on a weeknight in the Midwest city. You are sitting at a table in a meeting room of a local church. Actually, this is pretty close to a local church, isn't it? The barn behind the Wilson House. You have a copy of the book titled Alcoholics Anonymous with you, along with a pencil and paper. The first of the one-hour sessions is about to begin. This AA meeting is being hosted by one of the local groups, the leaders of home group members, who have taken the steps and have sponsored other alcoholics through them. It is now their turn to conduct the beginner's meetings. The only change we've made to this 1946 AA meeting is to use the page numbers from a later edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous rather than the page numbers from the first edition, which wasn't used at the time. Welcome to the first 
of four one-hour AA meetings that will change your life. During the next several weeks, you will learn how to recover from the affliction of alcoholism by taking the 12 steps as outlined by the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous has found an answer to this insidious illness. As members of AA, we are here tonight to share our solution with you, a spiritually based plan of action that will remove your compulsion to drink and provide you with a new way of living without alcohol. Our names are Steve and Wally, and we are members of Alcoholics Anonymous. We lead these meetings to help ensure our sobriety. We receive no payment for this service. Our reward is to watch people recover and to see them help others. We will start this session by reading a statement from the book Alcoholics Anonymous. We are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. There are no fees or dues whatsoever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. The book we are reading from is our textbook for recovery. We will, we will be using this book extensively during these sessions. What we just read sums up the AA Fellowship quite well. We are not a religion, and we don't get involved in politics, psychology, or medicine. As the title of the book implies, we are an, an anonymous society. You can be assured we will protect your anonymity at this and any other meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We ask that you do the same for us and for everyone else who is here tonight. The Big Book was first published in April of 1939. It was written by several of the first 100 men to recover from alcoholism. Since then, it has been used by alcoholics all over the world as a program for recovery. The original title of the book was 100 Men, because at the time it was being written, there were no women on the program. Then Florence R. started attending meetings in New York City. She stayed sober long enough to convince the men to change the name of the book, which they did. But because the book was so close to publication, the authors didn't have time to change the contents. So please keep this in mind as you read the book. It was written by men for men. Now, of course, there are many women on the AA program, but that wasn't the case when the book was first released. So we can complete each session within an hour and still provide ample time for questions. We request that you write down anything that you do not understand or need clarified and save it until the end of the session. We will answer questions at that time. The big book is the only book we will discuss during these meetings except for an occasional reference to an AA newsletter article or some of the source material used to write the big book. If you cannot find something we say in the big book, consider it to be our opinion rather than fact. We will do our best to keep our opinions out of these discussions. We are here to pass on the AA program as written and practiced by the early members. We are not here to present our interpretation of the program. The beginners meetings started in the early 1940s when AA started growing so rapidly it became impossible for the older members to individually take new prospects through the steps. The, me the sessions were formalized in September 1944 pamphlet titled Alcoholics Anonymous, an Interpretation of Our Twelve Steps, published by the Washington, D.C. group. Since 1944, this pamphlet has been reprinted throughout, this, throughout the country. The preface to the pamphlet contains the following. These meetings are held for the purpose of acquainting both the old and new members with the 12 steps upon which our program is based, so that all 12 steps may be covered in a minimum amount of time they are divided into four classifications, and one evening each week will be devoted to each of the four subdivisions. In 1945, the AA Grapevine, which is a newsletter published by our New York City headquarters, devoted three articles to the beginners' meetings. These articles describe the sessions in St. Louis, Missouri, Rochester, New York, and St. Paul, Minnesota. Each group has developed its own guidelines for conducting the beginners' meetings. However, all these groups have one thing in common. They provide a safe, structured environment in which newcomers learn the principles of AA, take the steps, and have spiritual experiences. In order for the process to work, newcomers must be matched up with those AA members who are willing to sponsor them through the four one-hour sessions. In addition, the newcomers and the sponsors must make a commitment to attend all the meetings together. 
So that the newcomers and sponsors will better understand what is expected of them, we are going to explain some of the guidelines for these sessions. For the newcomers, one, your primary obligation is to be here every week. If you do not have transportation, your sponsor will help you make the necessary arrangements. Two, we realize some of you are in no condition to read the big book at this time. Therefore, we will read the appropriate parts of the big book to you. For those of you who have brought big books and are able to follow along, please do so. We will announce each passage by page number and paragraph before we read it. If you are unable to read the book, please participate by listening. Keep in mind that if you do what we ask you to do, which is to take the steps as described in the big book, you will recover from alcoholism. Three, although a written inventory is part of the fourth step, this doesn't mean you have to do the writing. The person who is sponsoring you through these sessions can either help you write your inventory or he or she can write it for you. For the sponsors, let's see. your time commitment to the newcomer is four to five weeks. After that, both you and the newcomer will be expected to sponsor other people through, through the sessions. Two, during the next month, call or visit the newcomer frequently to see how he or she is doing and to offer encouragement and moral support. Three, make sure you and the newcomer attend all the sessions together. Four, offer to help the newcomer with his or her fourth step. If necessary, write the inventory based on what the newcomer tells you. Remember, the newcomer is still very sick and may not be able to complete the inventory without your assistance. Five, share your guidance with the newcomer. And six, answer any questions the newcomer may have about the AA program or the AA way of life. Okay, let's get started. First, will the newcomers please stand? These are the people who are here to take the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous during these four one-hour sessions. Will all the newcomers please stand? And I'm not sure what the head count is, but it looks like about 35. Uh, Steve, why don't you count while I... Now, those of you who do not have your sponsors with you tonight, please remain standing. Who does not have their sponsor with them tonight? Okay, several of you do. Okay, that's good. You do not. Yeah, remain standing. 37, 38. 37, 38. Wow. Okay. Now we need volunteers to sponsor those who are standing. Now will the people that are able to sponsor please raise your hands and look around and just point that hand to somebody close to you and that's the person you're going to sponsor. Okay, uh, we've got some people in the front that need to be sponsored. I need some hands pointing to the front. Okay, uh, there we go. Do we have sponsors? Okay, here we go. Uh, Dave, the sponsor here, Doug. Um, John's going to sponsor a couple. Okay, John's got a couple here. Okay, please sit down once you once you have your sponsor assigned. Uh, who's still left? Oh, Doug, I thought you were going to take Dave. No, Dick? Okay, there we go. Anybody else that needs a sponsor? Okay, who can sponsor? Who can sponsor? Please volunteer. You can sponsor more than one. Two, sometimes three have to double up just the way it was done in the 40s. There we go. Okay. And this gentleman here, who needs to who's gonna sponsor this gentleman? Okay. And these late four ladies, five, we have five ladies and six ladies left. Who can sponsor these ladies? Uh, if you could take this gentleman in the back with the with the beard and the ball cap. Okay, there we go. Yes, uh, just right behind you. Any other ladies that can sponsor? Okay. Yes, uh, you're going through as the newcomer, though, right? Yes, that's that's perfectly all right. Okay, we need we need we need somebody to really get um, in, involved, just like it was the 1940s. We're going to have uh, some.
Several women are going to have to sponsor sometimes three and four people. Who's willing to try it? Who's willing to try it? Okay, there we go. Please just just pick up the. Pick them up. Okay. And what? We have one lady still here. Two. Two ladies that still need to be sponsored. Who can sponsor these two ladies? Okay, there's the hand. Okay, just. Now, what we need for you to do is to exchange names and phone numbers after this session so that you can make contact with each other and, uh, and continue the relationship. Though sponsorship ends after these sessions, because after these sessions, you're both going to be asked to sponsor others. Sponsor new, all over. Okay, congratulations. Everybody's matched up and we're ready to go. We're going to start this session by turning to the forward of the big book, which is on Roman numeral page 13. Roman numeral page 13, at the top of the page we find, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So the big book authors immediately tell us the purpose of this book. And it's to show us how to recover from alcoholism. But this, and this is a revolutionary statement. Because until this book was written, there was no hope for alcoholics. Now, anyone who is willing to follow the directions they have provided can recover. This message of hope is expressed again at the bottom of page 17. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the common solution. Alcoholics it, Anonymous. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. At the bottom of page 25, the authors explain that for us, there is no middle ground. We are either going to die from alcoholism or else find a spiritual solution. If you are as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe that there is no middle-of-the-road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible, and if we had passed into the region from which there is no return through human aid, we had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could, and the other to accept spiritual help. In the first paragraph on page 44, they describe the alcoholic and then tell us what, is, what it's going to take to recover. Starting with line four, they write, If, when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if, when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. To make sure everyone understands what we just read, we are going to read this last line again. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. Now we know what we have to do in order to recover from alcoholism. We must undergo a life-changing spiritual transformation. We realize that this is not the answer many of you expected to find in Alcoholics Anonymous. I know I sure didn't. And um, it's one of the reasons why I almost didn't make it, because of all the references to God in this book. But then I learned it was a God of my own understanding, and it was a lot easier to, to accept the spiritual principles offered here. But please keep in mind that alcoholism is a fatal illness. Prior to AA, most alcoholics either died drunk or were locked up in jails or insane asylums. In the middle of page 44, the authors once again tell us our options. To one who feels he is an atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems impossible. Well, it certainly did to me. But to continue as he is means disaster, especially if he is an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. To be doomed to an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis are not always easy alternatives to face. Not only is a spiritual experience possible, it is a guarantee, provided you keep an open mind and take the steps as described in the big book. In the next paragraph on page 44, they tell us that no matter what our present beliefs, there is hope for us. But it isn't so difficult. About half our original fellowship were of exactly that type. At first, 
Some of us tried to avoid the issue, hoping against hope we were not true alcoholics. But after a while, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. Perhaps it's going to be that way with you, but cheer up. Something like half of us thought we were atheists or agnostics. Our experience shows that you need not be disconcerted. And we do. We find it amazing that the newcomer can start the Alcoholics Anonymous program without any specific beliefs, or for that matter, without any beliefs at all. All a person needs is the open-mindedness and willingness to believe that we believe this program works. And let us assure you that we do believe. Both Steve and I have come to believe as a result of taking these steps in these beginner's meetings. The 12 steps have changed our lives and the lives of thousands of other alcoholics. This program will change your life too if you honestly want to recover from this deadly affliction. Let us see what we can learn about this spiritual solution. In the first paragraph on page 45, the big book authors tell us, lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves. Obviously. But where and how were we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main objective is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. That means we have written a book which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. And it means, of course, that we're going to talk about God. In the second paragraph on page 46, the authors ask us to develop our own concept of God. In other words, they want us to find a God of our own understanding. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to effect a contact with him. As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. We found that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek him. To us, the realm of spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek. It is open, we believe, to all. They inform us that we are going to take some actions which will lead us to our Creator, who will guide us in the realm of the Spirit. Our personalities will change from self-centered to God-centered. Our lives will change from material to the spiritual. As we said earlier, Alcoholics Anonymous is not a religious program. We're free to call this power anything we wish, as long as it is a power greater than ourselves. The big book authors use many different terms or names for this power, including creative intelligence, universal mind, spirit of the universe, creator, and the great reality, among others. Quite a few times they call this power God, but they use the word God merely for convenience rather than for any religious purpose. Please refer to this power by any name you believe in or feel comfortable with. So, in order to recover from alcoholism, we have to find a power greater than ourselves. But where are we going to find this power? The authors provide us with the answer to that question in the second and third paragraphs on page 55. These paragraphs turned out to be a turning point in my life. Actually, we were fooling ourselves, for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or other it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. We finally saw that faith in some kind of God was a part of our makeup, just as much as the feelings we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality, capital G, capital R, deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. Deep down within each and every one of us is the fundamental concept of God. These are drastic and for some of us revolutionary concepts, and let us summarize them for you. 
First, the authors of the big book tell us they have found a way to free us from the bondage of alcoholism. Next, they describe the solution as a power greater than ourselves. Finally, they tell us where to find this power right inside each and every one of us. Now we know where to find this power, much of the rest of the big book is devoted to the question of how to find this power. Basically, we find the spirit of the universe by taking the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. These steps are found on pages 59 and 60. Please follow along with us as we read the steps to you. In addition, we're going to give you the page numbers with where each step is located in the book. Step 1. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. This step is described on Roman numeral pages 23 through 30 and on pages 1 through 43. The directions for taking step 1 are on page 30. Step 2. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. This step is described on pages 44 through 60. Step 3. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand Him. Or understood Him. This step is described on pages 60 through 63. Step 4 made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. This step is described on pages 63 through 71. Step 5. Admitted to God, to <laughs> ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. This step is described on pages 72 through 75. Step 6. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. This step is described on pages 75 through 76. Step 7. Step 7. Oh, let's get caught up here. I was dawdling. <laughs> <laughs> Asleep at the switch? I was actually listening. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> step 7. Humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. This step is described on page 76. Oh, okay. <laughs> Step eight. <laughs> Thank you. Progress. Progress, Progress not perfection. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Step nine. Made direct amends to such people. Oh, step eight. Made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And step nine. Oh, Paige, okay. Made direct amends to such people wherever possible, <laughs> except them to do so with injure them or others. This step is described on page 76 to 84. Step 10, continue to take personal inventory, and when we are wrong, promptly admit it. This step is described on pages 84 to 85. Like I said, these are brand new slides, and uh, we're learning for the first time where they are. <laughs> Not brand new material, but brand new slides. Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. All right. Step 1, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives have become unmanageable. <laughs> Surrender is essential in order to recover from alcoholism. The big book authors devote 51 pages of the book to the first part of the surrender process, which is to admit we have a problem. The authors begin by describing the physical and mental symptoms of alcoholism. Later, they ask us to acknowledge that we are alcoholics. Before we can do this, we need to know what an alcoholic is. Much of the doctor's opinion is based on two letters written by Dr. William D. Silkworth, a physician at Towns Hospital in New York City. In the late 1930s, very little was known about alcoholism, but much of what Dr. Silkworth wrote then is still re relevant today. On Roman numeral page 23, Dr. Silkworth describes how Bill W., one of the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, recovered from alcoholism. Bill had once been a well-respected Wall Street stock analyst, but he had lost everything due to his drinking. 
In late 1934, I attended a patient who, though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of type 1, had come to regard as hopeless. In the course of his third treatment, he, re he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his con conceptions to other alcoholics, oppressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This, this has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 <laughs> others appear to have recovered. I personally know scores of cases who were of the type with whom other methods had failed completely. For several years prior to 1934, Dr. Silkworth had been reading, al had, been tr had been treating, I'm sorry, <laughs> Alcoholics at Town Hospital. Reading in the right, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, alcoholics at, uh, he had been treating alcoholics at the town's hospital with very little success. Then during his third trip to the hospital, Bill discovered the spiritual solution to alcoholism, which he helped develop into the AA program. One of the things Bill learned while in town's hospital was that he had to work with other alcoholics in order to stay sober himself. He also learned that alcoholism was a physical and a mental illness which only a spiritual experience would conquer. On Roman numeral page 24, the authors confirm that Dr. Silkworth was well aware of the physical aspects of alcoholism. The physician who at our request gave us this letter has been kind enough to enlarge upon his views in another statement which follows. In this statement he confirms what we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe, and I do believe, now, that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. Didn't realize that. I thought I could drink like everybody else. My body is abnormal. My mind's always been abnormal, but the body part I didn't understand at all. It did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life, that we were in full flight from reality, or that we were outright mental defectives. <coughs> I could identify with the mental defective part, too. <laughs> but the body part, I had trouble with. These things were true to some extent, in fact, to a considerable extent with some of us. But we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. Let's look at this abnormal reaction to alcohol. Alcohol is a poison. So I'm a chemist. I should have known that. It never dawned on me. <laughs> what that skull and crossbones in my chemistry books meant because it wasn't on the Jack Daniels that I was drinking <laughs> the normal reaction to alcohol is to have one or two drinks and stop because they feel the effects of the poison but our reaction is much different we have one or two drinks just to get started <laughs> toward the bottom of page 28, Roman numeral page 28, Dr. Silkworth tells us that because of this abnormal reaction, we must refrain from drinking. Roman numeral page 28. All these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been by any treatment with which we are familiar permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. Well, I didn't like hearing that part either. But so much for alcoholics ever becoming social drinkers again. All right. Abstinence might work if alcoholism was only a physical illness. But Dr. Silkworth found that alcoholism alcoholism has a mental component as well. In addition to an abnormal physical reaction, we have a mental obsession. Our minds tell us we are okay, even as alcohol is bringing us closer and closer to death. No matter how much we may want to stop, sooner or later we will return to drinking. Dr. Silkworth describes this mental obsession in his letter on Roman numeral page 26. Please keep in mind Dr. Silkworth is talking about alcoholics when he describes at the bottom of the page 
Men and women drink es essentially because they, are, they like the effect produced by alcohol. The, sen the sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, injurious, they cannot, after time, differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic, alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented. Unless they can gain experience, unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. Yeah, that's social drinking. Starting with uh, line four on page thirty, the authors describe how this mental obsession kills so many of us. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. And don't I know it? Yes, don't we know it? Uh, also, we have... Uh, cartoon from the period it's talking about uh, pursuing it to the gates of insanity or death uh, the caption to this is uh, I'm not powerless over alcohol I just can't get up <laughs> the drunk in the doorway <laughs> and but can't we identify with this I really believe that yeah. even when I couldn't even get up I still didn't have a problem no I'm not powerless. <laughs> Gates of insanity or death. The big book authors further emphasize the mental obsession. That's what this is. <laughs> the mental obsession part. On page 34 by stating that no matter how strong our willpower or our conviction, we cannot stop drinking on our own. For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. We're assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he has already lost the power to choose, whether he will drink or not. Many of us felt that we had plenty of character. I was told I was a character <laughs> many times, but I uh, didn't think I had plenty of character. There was a tremendous urge to cease forever, yet we found it impossible. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it. This utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or the wish. You see, if our minds didn't lie to us and tell us that it's okay to drink, we would never trigger the physical craving for more and more alcohol. So we have an abnormal reaction of the body and an obsession of the mind which dooms us to an alcoholic death. And back on Roman numeral page 27, Dr. Silkworth tells us our only hope is a life changing conversion experience. Starting with line three on page Roman numeral page twenty seven. After they have succumbed to the desire again, and as many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change there is very little hope for his recovery. So a prominent doctor in the field of alcoholism tells us that the medical community can't help us. Our only hope is a spiritual awakening. Now let's move on to Bill's story. In this chapter we learn more about the physical and mental aspects of alcoholism and also more about the spiritual solution. As we mentioned earlier, Bill is the New York stock analyst who is one of our co-founders. Some people have difficulty identifying with Bill's story because he was such a low-bottom, hopeless alcoholic. Here is elsewhere in the book, we ask that you look for simul similarities rather than differences. See where you can identify with Bill as he continues to use alcohol long after it has become a problem. In the first seven pages, Bill describes the progressive nature of his drinking. In a few short years, he loses everything. He becomes an unemployed, hopeless drunk. On page 8, Bill has a moment of clarity. He realizes alcohol is his master. He is licked, defeated. 
No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. But Bill can't stop drinking on this admission alone. In late November 1934, he is visited by an old high school chum, Abby T. Bill is drunk. Abby has been sober for several months. When Bill asks Abby how he stopped drinking, Abby tells him, I've got religion. Bill is shocked, but he lets Abby continue because as he writes, my gin would last longer than his preaching. <laughs> yeah, Abby, Abby, uh, Abby explains to Bill that he has found a group of people who rely upon a power greater than themselves who live based on the guidance they receive from this power. In 1934, this organization was called the Oxford Group. In 1938, it became Moral Rearmament. The Oxford Group is a life-changing fellowship which utilizes four spiritual activities. These are, one, sharing and witnessing, which are the equivalents of our fourth, fifth, and twelfth steps. Two, surrender, which are the equivalents of our first, second, and third steps. Restitution, equivalent of our eighth and ninth steps. Four, quiet time and guidance, the equivalent of our eleventh step. Abby provides Bill with the Oxford Group solution. For the first time, Bill learns he can change his life by turning his will over to a God of his own understanding. Soon after Abby's visit, Bill checks into town's hospital. There, under the direction of Dr. Silkworth, Bill is physically withdrawn from alcohol for the third time that year. While in the hospital, Bill applies the Oxford Group for spiritual activities. In the second paragraph on page 13, Bill makes a complete surrender. Page 13, second paragraph. There I humbly offered myself to God as I then understood him, to do with me as he would. I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. Oh, okay. That's the slide that's missing. Okay. <laughs> then he sh Not bad for 200 new slides. I have to thank those ladies again. It's uh, early. Nikki and Linda. Nope, that's the only one. And they made it. I just forgot to shoot it. Then he shares his character liabilities with Evie. I ruthlessly faced my sins and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away, root and branch. My schoolmate visited me and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. When Bill wrote, I ruthlessly faced my sins, he used the Oxford Group definition for the word sin. And as James will concur, according to the Oxford Group, sin is anything that separates us from God. Or another person. And selfishness and self-centeredness is the cause. Sin is removed by following God's will rather than self-will. Yes. Yep. Oh. Starting with the next sentence in the third paragraph, Bill agrees to make restitution. This is an important part of moving from the problem of living by self-will toward the solution of relying upon God's will. We made a list of people I had hurt or toward whom I felt resentment. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals, admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. In the next paragraph, Bill practices quiet time and guidance. These activities are essential for establishing a two-way communication with the spirit of the universe. I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would become uncommon sense. I was to sit quietly, when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. At the bottom of page 14, Abby explains the, the necessity of witnessing to others. Starting, a starting with line 2 in the last paragraph, Bill writes, Particularly was it imperative to work with others 
as he had worked with me, as he had worked with me. Faith without works was dead, he said. And how appallingly true for the alcoholic. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrificing for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again, and if he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead indeed. With us, it is just like that. Bill takes the actions prescribed by the Oxford Group and has a sudden conversion experience. He has the entire psychic change that Dr. Silkworth talks about in the doctor's opinion. In the second paragraph on page 14, Bill describes his spiritual awakening. These were revolutionary and drastic proposals, but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory, followed by such a peace and serenity as I had never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. Bill's life had changed. He hasn't had a drink since. There is additional material within these 51 pages of the big book that further explains the physical and mental aspects of alcoholism and how our lives have become unmanageable as the result of our drinking. If you need more proof, please read on. All we've done is provide you with some of the highlights. However, we hope we've shown you enough for you to proceed. Now it's time for each of us to start our personal journey toward that spiritual experience which will change our lives. Let's see who's ready to take the first step. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. The big book authors tell us exactly what we have to do. In the middle of page 30, they write, We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. I don't see how much clearer it can get in terms of directions. It tells us exactly what we have to do and even tells us this is the first step step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. In order to smash the delusion that we're not alcoholics, <coughs> we are going to ask each of you to answer a simple question. Are you ready to concede to your innermost self you are powerless over alcohol? In other words, are you an alcoholic? All that is required is a yes or no answer. If you're not convinced you're alcoholic or that your life is a minute, oh, we'll do this in a minute, Oh, that, oh boy, jumping the gun here. Yes, I hear all the yeses already. Oh, God bless you. Wow. Goodness. Okay, they want the break. <laughs> Three more minutes. <laughs> okay. Wow. I'm lost now. Now, if, if you're not convinced you're alcoholic or that your life is unmanageable, please let us know. Your sponsor or spiritual advisor is going to spend time with you this week to discuss your reservations. If anybody has reservations, please, you don't have to say yes now, but please talk to your sponsor or spiritual advisor during the break. I want to give you every opportunity to comprehend the devastating consequences of this deadly affliction. Maybe you're not an alcoholic. Maybe you're here by mistake. We just want to know... Uh, We'd rather be inside the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous by mistake than outside the fellowship dying by mistake. It's something to think about. Okay, for those who are ready, let's proceed. Will the newcomers please stand? All the newcomers taking the steps in the Back to Basics Beginners Meeting. Okay, for those who are ready, let's proceed. Will the newcomers please answer this question? The first step question, do you concede to your innermost selves you are alcoholic? Please answer one at a time, yes or no. Starting over here. Yes. 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 And let's go over to here. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes or no? Good. Yes. And gentlemen? Yes. And who do we miss here? Do we miss somebody here? Okay. Yes. Okay, please sit down after you answer because we have so many people. Yes. 
And in the back here, starting with the ladies over here in the corner. Okay. And in the back. Oh. And, oh, and way in the back. All the way in the back. And Is anybody in the other room? Yes, All let's give right. them right. a hand. <laughs> really That's Congratulations. That's Congratulations. Because as written in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, those of you who answered yes to this question have completed step one. That's all there is to it. That's enough for tonight. In the past hour, we have covered 51 pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and have taken the first step. <laughs> this is a remarkable achievement. Congratulations. Next week, we will discuss step, steps two and three and four. We will take the second and third steps during the meeting and we will provide you with guidelines on how to take the fourth step. You will complete your fourth step inventory and share it with your sponsor or spiritual advisor between the second and third sessions. Are there any questions?